See that mute button they told me not to push? I, I understand why they don't want me to push that button, I guess. Uh, as I was saying, Joey, he's had a busy week. He just, he was down uh, sending off Will and Megan off to Indiana Wesleyan this week. And also, he, he was down in Fort Benning, Georgia with Will. Will graduated from basic combat training this week. So as I was thinking, when Joey asked me to do this, when he asked me to speak this week, I, I thought, man, what a great topic to speak over is basic training. You know, how often as Christians do we forget the basics? I mean, we, we can walk past the basic foundations that Christ has set for us. So I, I just thought to myself, you know, I, I knew what scripture I wanted to do, and I have a topic in mind. So as I, as I start, I'm going to kind of introduce uh, some of my experience. Um, a little over nine years ago, my wife, Mari, and me, we went through basic training at the same time. And, you know, it was just quite an interesting experience as, as I looked at, you know, growing in my relationship with, my, with the Lord and, and just really stepping out on my own. It, it was such a huge thing. I had never been away from home for more than a week. And, you know, so it was just, it was taking me out of my comfort zone. And what you learn right away in basic training is your instructors, they're not there to be your friends. They're there to break you down. They want to break you down basically so that way they can build you back up, so they can build that solid foundation. And in Christianity, it's the same thing. We need to go to a place that we're broken, where we can be built back up, where we can build our foundation on Christ. And if our foundation is not on Christ, then we're on a slippery slope. And we need to place our foundation right there on Christ. And, you know, they, they also the purpose of them being so hard on you, your instructors are so hard on you, because they want to weed out the people who aren't going to make it. Now, I'm not saying that as Christians we need to be weeding people out, but I think we need to be careful not to get complacent. We need to be careful that we're not allowing false teachings, that we're not allowing things that maybe are hurting the church to go on said, and we're correcting those things. You know, I, as I was in the military, I, I learned to think, I learned to act, I learned to dress, behave, and speak differently. Everything about me, every aspect of my life had changed in some way. And, you know, I think about Will and his experience. I, I'm, you know, with what Joey's been talking about, just the way that he's writing letters now that he's never wrote before, you know, just to see how the military just, it brings a new person out inside of you. It makes you into a, a new, stronger person where you can stand on your own. And, and again, I was not able to stand on my own through my military career. It was through the knowledge of Christ, me relying on Christ. You know, when Joey was talking about his son and looking forward to uh, services on Sunday, that was the way I was. I, I just, I drew so much strength through my week by going to church. And I was just amazed at, you know, the power that I received to get through the rest of that week. And as I said earlier, my wife and I, we joined together and went through basic training at the same time. During basic training, you know, I would see my wife from time to time, but it wasn't very often. We were on different flights, so that basically me meant that we would hardly ever see each other, maybe passing by going to church, or um, just from time to time when we're going to the, the BX. But for the most part, we never seen each other. And then there was one week in training that we, we were able to train side by side. And, you know, I was just encouraged as I see my wife and as I was training with her, just seeing that she was so strong and just thinking to myself, man, I want to I wanna be strong for my wife. But I was having such a hard time with it in my, own, my own self, but seeing her strong made me strong. And there was one, one time when we were training together, we both had, had to go through the same training. So she understood what I had to go through. I understood what she had to go through. And that really helped encourage me because there was somebody that I loved that could know exactly what I'm going through when I'm going through it because she at the same time was going through these same things. And during this one week of um, warrior week is what they call it, we both went through the gas chamber at the same time. And for those of you who don't know, it's basically they put you in a, a closed in room and then they fill the whole room up with gas and you have to say certain things. Well, as I was watching people come out of this room, I watched grown men fall to their knees crying and just kind of rolling around, you know, just looked weird. And then I see my wife come out in the midst of this as well, and she's sitting there laughing. And I'm thinking, man, 
if I come out crying, if I come out on my knees, you know, no one's ever going to let me live this down. This is going to be like embarrassing for the rest of my life, telling people that, you know, geez, my wife, she came out and I'm sitting there down on my knees crying. But it, she encouraged me to do better. With that being said, my wife was not able to do basic training for me. The things that she did in basic training, she had to do for herself. The things that I did in basic training, I had to do for myself. Yes, she brought me encouragement, but I had to work, I had to train, I had to learn and choose to succeed. She had to do those same things because we could not do them for each other. Again, you know, we can draw strength off of one another, but we cannot do those things. And as Christians, I think we have this mentality that, you know what, my, my parents, they're Christians. My friends, they're Christians. And, and the people that I hang around with, my family, they're Christians. All these people are Christians, so that means I'm a Christian. And I think that's such a, a bad philosophy because you have to make that choice for yourself. If you're not making that choice to be a Christian, if you haven't made that choice, no one else has made that choice for you. And God makes it clear that we have to make that choice ourselves. We have to realize that we must make the decision to follow Christ. We cannot rely on what others have done, the way that they've lived. We cannot rely on the things that they've done or the decisions they've made. Again, we have to do this for ourselves. And as Christians, you know, we're called to live, think, speak, and act differently. Just as I described how basic training gave me the skills that I needed to be successful in my career as in the military, our Bibles, our Bibles, the Word of God gives us the tools that we need to be successful in our walk with Christ, to be successful in our walk as a Christian. And when we're forgetting to read our Bibles, when we're not praying, when we're not speaking to the Lord, we're doing ourselves an injustice. We're not doing what God has called us to do. You know, and it, it's such a horrible way to live. If we're not, if we're claiming to be Christians and we're not looking to the guidance that God has set before us, then we're, we're doing an injustice. And so many times the world, they see people like that they see people who are claiming to be one thing. They see people who are claiming to be Christians and not living it because they're not focusing on what God's called us to focus on. You know, I think that one of the problems is that we, we start this initial phase in our faith. We start, but we don't finish well. It, the thing is, we, we have, you know, maybe a foundation and maybe the foundation wasn't completely built. Maybe we didn't understand the basics of our foundation. And that's why I'm calling us today is just to go back to the basics. What are the basics that we need to go to in our life? We need to build that foundation on Christ. If you haven't built your foundation on Christ already, I encourage you as I'm speaking, just think about this. Take this to heart. Look inside your own life and see, is this the way I'm living? Are these the things, are the things that I'm saying, are they equivalent to the way you're living your life? You may ask, how do we accomplish this? And, you know, I believe all throughout Scripture, there's answers on how we can build that foundation on Christ. But right now, if you do have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Romans 12, verse 9 through 21. You know, God gives us examples all through the Bible, and it's just so encouraging. And I think sometimes we miss these examples that he's given us. And as I read these, revert, these verses, remember what I said earlier about having to do things on our own. We cannot rely on what other people are doing. We cannot rely on our family to save us. We cannot rely on our friends, our spouses, our children. We have to do this ourselves. This has to be our relationship. And let me also warn you before I start reading this, uh, this is not a list of works of things that we, we have to do to be saved because we've, if we've accepted Christ, we've already been saved. But these are things that our life should be exemplifying. As we're living our life for Christ, it should, these things should be clear in your life. And again, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm up here perfect because I'm far from it. These things I fail at daily. I will be reading from the ESV version today. And the reason I'm reading from the ESV, I love the heading for the ESV. Uh, for Romans 9 through 21, it, it states marks of the, the true Christian. Now, that just says so much in itself. If we're to be true Christians, if we're living a, a Christian life, this is what our life needs to look like. These are the things that we need to be doing in our life. And the first uh, part of this is Romans 9 through 13. I feel like this is really talking about genuine love among believers. 
And this is something that, you know, maybe this is the area that we're doing the best in. We can do great when we're among believers. You know, we can, we can love on each other like crazy. And it, it's, you know, but when it comes to going outside of that, that's where we have difficulty. But I'm going to read this uh, first part for you. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek how to show hospitality. So as we start to look at this, I mean, the first thing that should stick out to you is what do we start with? We start with love. And so often, again, I think this is something we can fail to do, but love is where we start. As we look throughout the Bible, that that's one of the common themes that we can see, that the Bible is an overlying story of love all throughout, through the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's about the, the love that God has for us, and He wants to see us succeed. He wants to see us, uh, as Christians, just being... Um, loving him and, and being who he's called us to be and, and living in that fullness of him. And as, as we look at this, you know, we, we're called to let love be genuine. We're called to abhor. Abhor means to hate what is evil and hold fast to what is good. We need our love to be genuine. And we need to love one another with that brotherly affection. We need to outdo one another and showing honor. And, and I think oftentimes we have this mentality of, okay, outdo. So I'm going to one-up you. I'm going to do a little bit better than you. But I don't think that's what God is saying here. God is saying that, you know, I want you to be so in love with me that your heart's not going to be content with doing the minimum. You're going to want to do more. You're going to want to show love to more and more people. We're called not to be slothful, not to be lazy, basically, in zeal, in our passion, being fervent, in our passionate, uh, or being passionate in our, the spirit that we serve the Lord and rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulations. This is something that we all struggle with. When we're going through a hard time, it's, it's so hard to find the patience to go through this. But time after time, if you've gone through these hard times, you will realize that God has been faithful. God has been right with you all throughout that hard time. And if we rely on that, if we know that knowledge and we're not... Uh, trusting in that. I, again, we're, we're not fully trusting in God. Be constant in prayer. This is something we all fail at. This is something I have such trouble doing. There's, you know, we're told to, to pray consistently, constantly praying. And I mean, everything that we do, we're called to be in prayer. And it's hard to, to know, when am I supposed to be in prayer? If I'm not in prayer enough? And, you know, I think that it's just basically saying that as we're going through our day, if we sense a struggle, we need to pray about it. If we sense that someone else is struggling, we need to pray about it. We need to open up our lives and realize that, you know, we need to be thinking about God. And as we're thinking about God, we need to be thinking about others. And, and just praying about circumstances, praying how we can just open our lives up more to God. Go to slide four for me. The next section is... Uh, verses 14 through 16. Um, this is love in action. You know, we're called to love believers, but how does loving somebody, how does that actually look? You know, I don't think we really know the way to live this out. We, we're told to love, but what does love really look like? And here's what it says. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. I just don't even understand this. You know, God calls us to, to bless those who persecute us. I mean, what is, what is he saying here? Why is he telling us to, to do good to people who are doing bad to us? I mean, the world tells us it's okay if we're doing, you know, if we're seeking that revenge, if we're getting that revenge on those people who have done bad to us. I mean, that's okay. You know, everything in the, the world, we can watch movies, we can watch television. Everywhere we look, it's, this is a constant theme that, you know, get your revenge. You deserve this. This is yours. You, you can have this. But God tells us not to seek that. God tells us to bless those who persecute. He tells us that we're supposed to, to love on those people. We're also 
told to rejoice with those who rejoice. So we're, we're supposed to cheer with those who are cheering. When someone's experiencing joy in their life, you know, we're supposed to help them in that time and, and express that joy with them. When someone's having a hard time, we're supposed to weep with them. As they're crying, we cry. Coming alongside them as brothers and sisters in Christ and saying, you know what, I don't know how God's going to do this. I don't know what he's got planned for this time in your life, but he has something planned and you can trust in that. So when we, we trust in the Lord, we, we know that we can do these things. We can weep with those who weep. We are called to live in harmony with one another. I mean, that, that's such a big thing that we don't live in harmony with. I know my, my house can often seem like it's in disharmony, let alone within the church. How are we supposed to live like that? People here, we're all so different and I just don't understand how are, we, how are we called to do this, and especially outside of these walls. How can we live in harmony with people who don't believe what I believe and who don't think the way I think? But we're called to do this. And again, this is where prayer comes into play because I can't do these things on my own. These are not the natural way of living. Again, our selfishness, our, our human sides tell us that, you know, get your revenge. But God tells us harmony is where we are, should be. Do not be haughty. This word, I, I wasn't sure. Haughty means to be proud. But we're, we're called to associate with the lonely, with the lowly, with the people who, you know, the people who are living on the streets, the people who, you know, we wouldn't give a second look to. We're called to associate with those people. We're not called to look above them because, you know what, God has told us in Scripture that all who believe in Christ have been made equal. There's no separation between you who are Greek, Jew, Gentile, slave, it doesn't matter what your title is here on earth. It doesn't matter if you're a millionaire. It doesn't matter if you have nothing. We're all equal. And, and that's just such an amazing thing. So we're never to be wise in our own sight. Again, this is something that we struggle with so often that we don't, we don't understand what, how God can allow us to, to do this, how, why God wants us to do these things. Go to slide five, please. Slide five talks about our genuine love and action towards an enemy. Again, this is so hard because we want our revenge. We want those things that, you know, we earned this, we've done this, and so we, we deserve this. But you know what? God tells us we don't deserve anything. We're to repay no evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, as we're looking at this, this is such an amazing statement. God is telling us not only to love these people, but we're, we're told that we're supposed to repay evil with good. We're not to be like the sinners. We're not to be like the people who are, are living their lives constantly away from God. The, the people who suggest that there is no God, we're, we're called to love these people. And you know, I've seen so many times where as Christians, we fail to do this. We're just as guilty as hating our neighbors as the people that we're hating on. And, and you know, that's what sends such a sour taste in so many people's mouths because they can see that as Christians, we're just pointing the finger. But you know what? We're doing the same things that we're pointing the finger about. So we need to be really careful in this section. We need to be really careful that we're doing good and we're not avenging ourselves. We're not trusting that our knowledge is better than theirs, but we're trusting that whatever they've done against us, that God is going to repay those things. Not saying that we deserve anything because wrath and destruction is upon them because of what God has done. Vengeance is his. It's not mine to take. We're called to feed the hungry. We're called to, you know, be with those, that, to give drink to the thirsty. We're called to do these things. And as we do them, the amazing thing is that God doesn't just, you know, let those things go unnoticed. It's like taking a heap of burning coal and just pouring it over their head. And there's two different meanings that can be associated with this. A lot of people at this point, they believe that 
this is just a, a way saying that these people, they'll feel so bad about what they've done that they'll want to come to repentance. But then there's also in the Old Testament where this heaping of burning coals was a way of showing that these people had disobeyed God and showing that they were, they were to be punished by God. So these people were to be punished by God. That's what the heap of burning coals over their head was about, it was punishment. So again, this isn't ours. This isn't our punishment. This is nothing that we can do, nothing that we should be doing. But this is all God's. If we can go to slide two. When I was reading this, the thing that uh, stood out to me the most was, this is the fruit of the Spirit. You know, we often look, how is the fruit of the Spirit lived out? What is it, what is it, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Why are we called to live like this? And how do we live like this? But, you know, I've seen such, so much coinciding with one another in this. Um, We're told in Galatians 5 that, we're supposed to keep in step with the Spirit. We're supposed to avoid what is evil. And we will know that we are succeeding by the fruit that is described in this section. The Galatians five twenty two through 23 states, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things, there, are, there is no law. Go to, to slide six, please. As we look at this, we, we can see that these are lining up in so, so many ways. And I'm just amazed at how God's word comes together in, in such an amazing way. And as, as we're reading the Bible, I, I hope we realize that this Bible, the way it was written, was written as a story. This story is lining up from the beginning to the end. This story is a continuing story. And we're part of this story right now. And as we're looking through these things, as we look, love, we can see love in the the marks of the true Christian. We can see joy as we rejoice and express joy. We can see peace as we are called to live peaceably with one another. We can see patience because we're called to be patient in tribulation. As we're in trials, we're called to be patient. We can see the kindness as we're called to live in kindness. We can see the faithfulness as... Because if we are faithful, the Lord will be faithful as well. The Lord has called us not to seek our own vengeance, but we're supposed to be faithful to trust that He will seek that vengeance. And we're called to self-control. We're, we're called not to avenge the things that have done, been done against us, but we're called to love. We're called to do the opposite of these things. And right now you might be saying to yourself, you know what, I'm not living by any of these things. These things do not represent my life at all. Or maybe you're saying that, you know what, there's two on this list that I, you know, maybe kind of am doing good on. And, you know, I think so often Christians look at this and they they can see that. They see that, you know what, I'm not living by these things. This is not a representation of my life. And I want to warn you right now that if you're having trouble seeing in your own life where these things are coming through, we really need to evaluate ourselves. We need to evaluate, you know, why am I not doing these things? Has, you know, God not been calling me to do these things? Has God not been laying that on my heart that I need to be loving people more, that I need to be expressing joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Has God not been laying that on my heart? And, you know, I, I say this as a warning that we need to, look inside of our lives if we're not living this way honestly why not i'm not saying that by doing these things that we're saved but our lives as we become christians as we accept the lord our lives should start representing those things up there because we will love the lord so much that these things will just become a natural part of our life i came across this article it's by a scottish preacher named robert murray mcshane he lived in the 1800s uh, and he heeds a warning for us all. I want you guys to listen, uh, listen to this because this is, this is so scary to think about. But I think many of us within the church might be living like this. Not all that have seen the branches, not all that seem to be branches are branches of the true vine. Many branches fall off the tree when high winds begin to blow. All that are rotten branches. 
So in times of temptation or trial or persecution, many false professors drop away. Many that seemed to be believers went back and walked with no more with, the, with Jesus. They followed Jesus, they prayed with him, they praised him, but they went back and walked with him no more. So it is still. Many among us doubtless seem to be converted. They begin well and promise fair. Who will fall off when winter comes? So have fall, some have fallen off, I fear, already. Some more may be expected to follow. These will not be blessed in dying. Oh, of all the deathbeds may I be kept from, beholding the deathbed of the false professor. I have seen it before now, and I trust I may see it again. They are not blessed after death. The rotten branches will burn more fiercely in the flames. Oh, think what torment it will be to think that you spent your life pretending to be a Christian and lost your opportunity of becoming one indeed. Your hell will be all the deeper, blacker, hotter that you knew so much of Christ and were so near him and found him not. I don't know what you guys do with that, but to me, that scares me because I know that there's some in here that are living lives like that. I know that, you know, even searching with myself, I, I have a tendency where I could become like that. But if I'm truly walking in God, I know that I'm a true branch and I know that I will not be taken out when the storms come. And this is, this is so hard because, again, it might be a family member, it might be, it might be a friend that is falling away or, or has claimed these things. I know I've been dealing with this for some time. I have a friend who just continues to, to call me, uh, to email me, and he, he's just, he was the person I looked to as a Christian example, and he's fallen away from Christ, and now he's trying to drag me down with him. And, you know, I see this so often in the church that, you know, maybe something happens, and then we go our own way because we feel like our rights have been violated. But we never think twice about what God wants. We never think twice about what God has called us to do. It just really scares me to know that there, there are these branches that have fallen away. These branches that are not living for Christ anymore. I want us not to let our guards down as Christians. I, I think we need to stand strong. I think we need to... We need to rely more on God. We need to rely more on His Word. We need to rely more on prayer. And we need to not let our guard down as Christians. We, not, we should not become complacent with our walk with Christ. We need to try to exemplify the love that is described in Romans, Galatians, the rest of the Bible. All through the Bible we see this love. What a beautiful example that Christ was that He gave Himself for us. This walk is not easy. I'm not going to sit up here and say that, you know, these things are going to become easy. I'm not going to stand up here and say that, you know, once you become a Christian, everything is handed to you, that you're perfect and there's no, no need for you to change because that would be an out, outright lie. But I am going to say that with God, anything is possible. As we accept Christ, we can do the impossible. The impossible becomes possible. This walk, again, is not easy. And the closer we come to Christ, the more likely we are to be attacked because we're becoming like Christ. We draw the attention of our enemy, the devil. You know, he's waiting there for us. He wants to see us fail, and he doesn't want to see us succeed. He doesn't like it when we're drawing near. When we're starting to act like this, when we're doing these things, the devil, he's right there beside you because he doesn't want to see that, that lived out in our life. He doesn't want to see lives changed like this because there's power in that change. Our enemy, he's not just sitting on the sidelines. We have an enemy that prowls around like a roaring lion. We need to understand that we as Christians are in a battle. And as any battle, we know that there are certain things that are required of us. We need